Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Barker from Trinity College Dublin, and I'm going to present today the results of my master's project, which was measurement of sub subbandage pressure during venous compression therapy uh, using flexible core sensors. So just first, I'd like to just kind of provide a background to the actual condition and the reason why um, compression bandaging is used. So the main condition would be chronic venous insufficiency. And in normal healthy patients, both the venous valves and regular muscle contractions through motion um, assist in blood return from the lower legs. But in some patients, venous insufficiency can develop just due to valvular incompetence or other inactivity. And this is commonly associated with old age, so a lot of elderly people would experience this. Um, if venous insufficiency isn't treated, a uh, chronic venous insufficiency can occur. So CVI results in blood just collecting or pooling in the lower legs, and it just kind of return back up to the heart. So it's stagnating, and it also causes um, venous hypertension, which then results in, as you can see there, up on the leg, a number of problems, um, which are very desirable. So this, the current gold standard then in terms of treatment for this uh, problem would be compression therapy or compression bandaging. And it's very simple uh, theory in that if you can, a good analogy would be a tube of toothpaste in that the bandage applies a greater pressure at the foot and at the ankle and lower pressure up towards the, uh, the knee and the top of the calf. And this just assists in squeezing the blood back up to the, to the circulatory system. But if left untreated, uh, CVI results in pain, swelling, edema, skin changes, and ulceration, as I saw in the previous slide. And it's actually remarkably prevalent, particularly in Western countries. It's one of the top ten most common uh, medical conditions, and it's got a significant uh, socio-economic impact as well. So, as I, sa as I stated, the gold, current gold standard treatment would be uh, multilayer compression bandaging, and there's a huge variety of different types of bandages and different types of standards that can be used. But in general, the typical pressure range would be 10 to 60 millimeters of mercury. And just to try and quantify that as well, um, if you've ever worn those uh, compression socks for deep vein thrombosis on a long flight, they typically apply a maximum about 15 to 20 millimeters of mercury. So the bandages would apply up to maybe three times that amount. So they are quite tight and they're quite kind of restrictive um, during normal use. So existing devices that are used mainly for clinical training would be the kikamine and the Pico Press. And these devices are pneumatic, pre pneumatic pressure transducers. And they only support one probe at a time. So you can't get a an array of sensors. It's just for evaluation in one point only. Um, the Kikami in particular requires a lot of calibration before use. And the sensors, they're two or three millimeters thick. The Pico Press is much easier to use. Just, it, just, it doesn't require any prior calibration. And the sensor is. 0.2 millimeters thick, but these are mainly used for clinical training in that they're lab-based, they're not exactly portable, and they can't be used to measure multiple locations over a period of time. So this is just a sample of the existing dynamic pressure data taken use uh, by Parsh using the Kikami probe. And as you can see, the yellow line there corresponds to the type of bandage that we were investigating, which was a long stretch bandage. And um, as you can see, it's Quite, um, the existing data is quite uh, apparent like for as to what the patient is actually doing at the time. And for example, here, this just flexion of the foot. You can see it's just got a regular kind of sine wave uh, type action. Then standing, walking, standing would be the flat section here. Walking is then you have more uh, motion, just a regular sine wave. And then knee bending, again, you can see it's quite apparent as to what the patient's doing. So this is what the data that we'd be aiming for in terms of dynamic pressure data. It was decided then to use um, FlexiCore sensors because these sensors are they've been out for a number of years at this point and they have some limited use in bio applications. But they're perfect for this particular application because they're thin, flexible, durable, and waterproof. And they're unaffected by turbulent curvature effects. They generate signal, or continuous signal output and they're relatively cheap as well, only approximately 14 euro each. It's a um, piezo-resistive sensor, so it consists of two layers of polyester substrate film, um, with silver conductive material applied over substrates, and then it's followed by a layer of pressure uh, sensitive ink. So they're a very simple sensor, quite small, and 
very remarkably thinner, about thinner than a sheet of paper. And um, there was some existing data as well that we found in literature where um, Al Kabari uh, investigated a number of different uh, strain sensors used, or force sensors used uh, for compression bandaging. His study is quite limited, though, in that he only evaluated them on a leg model and didn't obtain any dynamic pressure data. So combining that study and any existing data, what we tried to achieve was uh, using the FlexiPore sensors to obtain dynamic pressure data during the study. And using this as, I suppose, inspiration, we were able to identify the locations and best locations in which to uh, place the FlexiPore sensors on the back of the leg. So in order to get these sensors up and running and get them to work, we first have to create an excitation circuit. Um, this is all recommended by the manufacturer. As you can see, we were aiming to get the sensors calibrated so that their, their response would be in a low force, a low force range as possible. And that corresponds to the five pound force range, which is the lowest recommended by the manufacturer, which is roughly two kilos. So we developed a four-channel excitation circuit and then optimized it further for the sensors. Um, and as you see the circuit there, it's relatively straightforward. It's, we use a maximum drive voltage for five volts and then the maximum value for the feedback resistance is 1.5 mega ohms. So we really push it down into the lowest force range as possible. And this corresponds roughly to 0 to 96 millimeters of mercury uh, for pressure. In terms of testing and calibration, and this is based on existing studies that have been done, and there's some improvisation as well. So the sensor calibration is performed using a blood pressure cuff mounted over a leg model, and the leg model consisted of a rigid cardboard tube. So the sensor is placed over a layer, a very thin layer of cotton wool in order to provide some sort of um, cushioning against the hard surface. Then it was mounted, the blood pressure cuff was mounted directly over that, uh, the sensor is connected to the excitation circuit, from the excitation circuit into a MIDAC, data acquisition device. Then from there via USB to the computer and all measurements were performed in LabVIEW and just because it provided real-time feedback and data logging. I then applied the pressure um, using blood pressure cuff in stepwise increments from 0 to 100 millimeters of mercury in 10 millimeters of mercury steps and this is to determine the gain and various other um, properties which are well present on the next slide. Um, this setup was, was quite efficient in that it provided the applied pressure there and then the actual measured pressure was also displayed on the screen. So you could, it was quite apparent um, if there's good um, consistency between the two or not. Then for other, I suppose other um, properties which were being evaluated such as um, drift, uh, curvature effects and thermal effects. The same setup was used, just modified slightly. So the results of this are that the majority of sensor properties were well within the stated values from the manufacturer. Um, however, hysteresis and repeatability were a major concern here. And this contributed to um, the most significant error was from re repeatability, which was 15%. Um, the majority of the time, the error is within 5%, so that's much more of just a worst case scenario. Um, but as you can see, the drift, linearity, curvature effects, and thermal effects were all well within the, um, the, the manufacturer's range. And as I said, it's for history and repeatability, it's probably due to operating the sensors at the lower limits of the recommended force range. Because these flexible force sensors are capable of measuring forces up to 5,000 kilos. So when you're pushing it right down to two kilos, you're going to probably encounter a few problems. So based on those results, we managed to create a measurement device. And as you can see here, it consists of the excitation circuit there, uh, a thick microcontroller circuit, which is just used for data logging, a lithium-ion battery pack, which is placed behind the two circuit boards, and then the four sensors here, which are tailored for um, the positioning on uh, each leg. It was housed in a modified iPhone 5 uh, case that attaches directly to the leg and is mounted just above the knee. And the, pick, the data logging circuit is the sam sample data at a rate of 2 hertz, which was sufficient in order to prevent um, aliasing of the signal during walking and running. So leading on to clinical testing, 
the bandages were applied to me at the Venus Clinic in St. James Hospital in Dublin over a number of different uh, sessions. Because we under the four channel input for the excitation circuit, um, we placed two sensors up near the top of the calf, just below the knee, as recommended, and then another two down near the ankle. Um, various leg movements were performed over a 15 minute period, and I kept the bandage on for eight hours each time, and on the hour I'd repeat the, the same um, exercises in order to determine if there had been any changes or drift or if the sensors had been affected just by the presence of the bandage. And moving on to the clinical results, which is I suppose the key slide here. This is a, a snapshot of one of our um, of one of the 15 minute evaluation sessions. And this is all raw data, it hasn't been filtered or anything. And as you can see, sensors one, sensor two, which are placed down towards the ankle, they experience a much higher pressure, which is exactly within the expected range. And sensors three and sensors four, which are placed um, up near the knee, they experience a much lower pressure, again, which is almost by on the expected range. But there's a few uh, interesting points here that I'd just like to point out that haven't really been covered from existing research. Um, for leg flat and standing, you can see that the pressure is slightly decreasing um, as the bandage is on the leg. I noticed a bit of uh, variation here between the two uh, sensors, but as I said, that's just due to operating them at such a, a low force range. Um, but you can see kind of a decline, whenever the le leg is static, if the, the pressure constantly declines. And that's basically because the bandage is doing its job. It's squeezing the blood out of the leg, which contracts the leg inwards, which then results in a lower pressure being applied by the bandage. An interesting bit here as well from uh, when you're walking, um, there's this pumping action, which is quite significant. So for the first uh, couple of seconds, or 30 seconds up to a minute, as you walk, your the blood is rushing into the leg, and the muscle contractions are also stimulating blood flow within the leg. So the blood pressure suddenly increases. So the leg then expands outwards, and then the bandage obviously applies a, a larger uh, pressure or larger pressure to, to the leg, which then contracts once you uh, remain static. So the initial results are promising. There's been good correlation between the existing pressure data and then our results that we obtained. Accuracy and repeatability can be proved by using more sensors per array, and that's certainly something to investigate in the next step of the project. So it's an array of four sensors on the upper leg and four on the lower leg should be sufficient if you were to obtain the average of each one. Um, it should provide relatively accurate uh, pressure data. Uh, the device that we have was developed just using various components that are available to us at the time that are used for other research projects within the university. So it could be further optimized to reduce size and cost by removing redundant components and removing duplicate components. Um, and also, the device itself was developed very cheaply. I think the total cost came to about 80 euro for all the components within it. Um, the system could potentially be adapted for other uses, such as monitoring pressure sores in beds and wheelchairs. And there was a, a limited investigation into that, whereby, it, say, for instance, a, an overlay or a layer on top of a mattress could be placed in a hospital bed with an array of these sensors embedded within it. And because they're waterproof and durable, it'd be perfect for uh, any kind of clinical setting. So it could alert clinicians as to when a patient is going to develop or potentially develop a pressure sore and in ex what area. And same for, um, same for a wheelchair cushion. Sensors could be embedded within the wheelchair cushion and then the user could be notified to shift their balance to prevent uh, pressure sores developing. Those are just some sample ideas as to what can be done in the future. And at the moment, so in terms of research, protocols have been developed for a registry trial in St. James Hospital in Dublin, in the Venus Clinic, whereby we could possibly enlist up to 10 patients, give them 10 devices. And because the bandages have to be changed every three or four days, depending on the patient, we could just leave the devices on the patient, left, left, leave them to run continuously for four days if they're housed in a waterproof case. And then when the patient gets back to the hospital, we just remove the bandage and then gather the sensors and gather the data as well. So it would be an interesting trial and it's definitely potential there for uh, more research. But at the moment, the results of the massive project, this is all crammed into the six months and I finished this in March. But it's, the groundwork is there and it just requires some further uh, development. And um, that's it, so thank you.